Welcome to What That Means with Camille, where we take the confusion out of tech jargon and encourage more meaningful conversation about cybersecurity. Here is your host, Camille Moorhart. Hi, I'm Camille Moorhart, and welcome to this episode of What That Means Data Anonymization. Today, we're actually going to meet with Kristen Yorich, who is a Senior Solution Specialist at SAP for HANA Architecture. And I'm gonna let her describe what HANA architecture is, but I wanna just say briefly, SAP is a world leader in enterprise resource planning or ERP software. And for those of you who need a brief refresher, ERP, which now scales to almost any size business, but was classically developed for larger enterprises, helps enterprises manage all different kinds of aspects of their company, all different systems. So it can range from everything from payroll to supply chain to purchase order tracking. And it can actually also even integrate to a degree with customers and vendors so that it can keep track of all these things. Can also make some automated decisions if you choose to do that. You can see clearly the connection then to the importance of data anonymization. You're dealing with all kinds of data. So we're going to get into that. So welcome, Kristen. It's great to have you here all the way from Berlin. Hello, everybody. Really glad to be here tonight. I know that SAP HANA is optimized on Intel architecture, but I'm hoping that you can just describe what HANA is briefly for people. So HANA in general is an in-memory database. That database, you have a lot of capabilities that come along, and one of them is actually data anonymization. I know it's an itty-bitty part, as you said, of all of... HANA, but what is it? Why is it important? And and what is it actually? If we speak about data anonymization, it's all about like personal data that is in the end irreversibly altered. And that's really important because here, the important thing is that the data subject can no longer be identified directly or indirectly. Let me just give you an example. We all know that student class of 20 people, 20 students sitting within a class, and you have one student wearing a red shirt. So if the teacher calls out that one particular student with a red shirt, everybody in that group of 20 students will know exactly who that person is. But if we would have five students with red shirts and the teacher calls out that one particular person with a red shirt, nobody would actually know who of those five students is actually men. So we're hiding one particular individual in a group of five students. And this is exactly what data anonymization is about if we speak about the concept of K-anonymity. We're hiding one particular person in a group so that we can no longer identify that particular one person. These methods that we have applied in HANA data anonymization actually stem from research. There are two methods that we've applied. One is K-anonymity. As I said, we're hiding individuals in groups. And then we have the other concept, which is differential privacy. So there we're applying noise to the data so that we're no longer able to, for example, know exactly what type of earnings individual people have, what type of salary individual people have, because in a group of four, for example, and you have salaries from 40,000, 50,000, 60,000, and 70,000, we would alter that so that in the end have data such as 10,000 and 100,000. So in that data set as a whole of these four people, we wouldn't be able to know exactly who earns what, but um, the data set as a whole would still make a lot of sense. What good does it do the company if you don't have access to this specific information? GDPR, for example, we can only use data which is no longer personal. So we can only process it. We can only use it for analytics. We can only use it for machine learning if it's no longer personal. If the data is personal, we can't process it. So if a company has a lot of data, personal data about individuals, they're not able to use it. So they need to really adopt data anonymization so that the data is no longer rendered personal and we can actually use it for other types of scenarios. You're looking at analyzing data sets or looking at making modifications of the way that processes are running within the company or across the company, but you can't pull out very specific identifiable, we'll call it personal or private traits. Mm-hmm. So you're, instead, you're, you're abstracting it that's probably not the right word. You're probably not abstracting it. You're making it very specific, but hiding the source. 
let's say we're generalizing the data or the individuals and groups. So what existed before K-anonymity? To my knowledge, K-anonymity or differential privacy are like concepts that evolved through anonymization. And these concepts really came with the uprise of the discussions about anonymization. This is kind of a new emergence of a new way of doing things, anonymizing data. Before that, companies just had the data, saw the data, tried to protect the data. Now we're saying, I guess, an evolution of culture, society saying that's not enough. You actually need to anonymize it. Exactly. Since we have new laws and regulations in place, companies need to adhere to these laws and regulations. And this is exactly the reason why we're now speaking about data anonymization. Can you tell us a little bit more about actually how it works? Are there sort of different aspects of data anonymization, different rules or parameters you need to enter? What kind of decisions do you have to make when you're setting it up? You know, give you a couple of different use cases and you will see that we're speaking about complete different data sets. And depending on those use cases, we'd actually alter the data or apply one or the other technology or methodology. One of the use cases that we have been working on is actually a use case from around last year, July. We had a hospital that approached us and they said, due to the uprise of the COVID-19 pandemic, they had collected a lot of patient data. They knew or they came to the understanding that some patients were from a specific ethnical background, that some patients were really fit, others weren't as fit. There were patients with preconditions. So all of these different traits were actually really interesting because every patient with certain traits reacted differently to a treatment. And the hospital said it would be fantastic if we can make this data available so that when other people are admitted to a hospital with the same disease with COVID-19, it would be easier to cure because we already have some learnings. We have some understanding of what worked well and what didn't work so well. This is exactly what we were working on. We were actually working on, let's say, a shareable COVID-19 database so that different companies, institutions, healthcare organizations were able to access this data and generate learning about, let's say, COVID-19 and knew better how to treat the different patients. This is, for example, one use case in the healthcare and life science industry. And then there's also another use case in the traffic planning industry. So when looking into traffic planning, we have a lot of mobile phone providers. Everybody now has a smartphone. And as we're walking around with our smartphones, this smartphone data, this point of location data is actually sensitive data. So this data needs to be anonymized in order to use this kind of data. So like say traffic planners were really interested in using this data because if they know that a lot of people are on a subway at a certain point in time, so maybe we need to have more subways or, you know, having them run every two minutes instead of every 10 minutes so that we can actually respond to the need of the people. Obviously with that, you could actually reduce emissions because if you have a better offering in terms of subways, you would have less traffic on the roads and less emissions into the atmosphere. It's also, let's say, a really interesting use case. And then we also have a use case regarding company travel expenses. So let's assume we have a travel agency and the travel agency is booking company trips. And a person between 30 and 35 calls in and needs to travel to Frankfurt. It would be really good for that agent to be able to advise based on the learnings of past travels where the best hotel would be, where good restaurants are and where people like to go. Well, all of that data, if we look at one particular individual, is personal data because it tells us where a person has been. That data is sensitive and needs to be anonymized for that travel agent to actually use the data and work with the data and give me, as I'm calling in in order to book my trip to Frankfurt, give a good advice of where I should go. As you can see, we have really different parameters because having those different use cases. So every time we speak about data anonymization, it's really important for us to really get into the depths of the use case and then decide which of the two methodologies should be applied and how we can actually bring the use case to life. I think all the use cases are really interesting and I can see the clear benefits to any individual and the clear unnecessity to have the private information. It makes sense to me. Like, of course, I want to get the best hotel, but I, of course, don't want to know who was in it last week or whatever. That's not my business. 
Do you ever worry, though, that especially in compute and with AI out there now, that if you define parameters for one specific use case very, very carefully, that if the data somehow leaked, you could then figure something else out if you had malicious intent, let's say, because the parameters were set to protect one thing, but now somebody's looking for something else. Is that a concern in this field? It is definitely a concern. I mean, there's lots of researchers that state that we don't have an absolute anonymization. There's always a certain risk to revert the data so that you can actually find out that potential individual. But I think science and especially us from a technology part, we're doing everything possible that this is not going to happen. We do our best that this this particular individual is no longer identifiable. There's always a certain risk, I'd say. Yeah. How do you know whether your personal information is being collected and whether that data then is being anonymized? I guess you're saying if you're in Europe, the GDPR, which I'm going to forget exactly what it stands for. Data protection. General data protection and privacy. So that's kind of like the, I guess, America's healthcare HIPAA, but it's GDPR is broader than healthcare. Mm -hmm. So are you guaranteed because of like public policy or do you have to look at individual companies to know who's doing what? Like if you're allowing an app, say, to collect your information on your location? How do you know whether it's being protected or anonymized? Every company here, if we speak about GDPR, has to comply to GDPR. There are breaches which are um, significant and they're tracked. So it's really important that uh, companies that have headquarters or operations in Europe um, apply GDPR. And with that, we already have a certain amount of standards that are defined. We don't actually have concise definition of anonymization, but there's been lots of interpretation by researchers what anonymization means. And this is something that's scientifically approved. And I think from that standpoint, you have that guarantee, you have those privacy guarantees that your data is not being used you know, differently in different companies. There is one standard of how key anonymity, how differential privacy should be applied. If you incorporate that into software, then this should be, let's say, the same in any kind of application or database. What are people in your field sort of arguing over right now? For example, a good, uh, let's say, point of discussion is currently anonymizing unstructured data. Here, HANA data anonymization, we're only using structured data, but then unstructured data would be emails or different types of data sets or even social media is also a part of unstructured data. And to anonymize that, that's something that's not easy to do. And that's something that a lot of researchers, but also technologists are currently looking into in order to find an answer to. With structured data, you mean, like for the example of the hospital data, it's all entered in a specific way. Mm -hmm. So you have more control over how you're tackling it mm -hmm. versus unstructured, which is what it just says, free flowing. So now you're scanning all kinds of different information. Exactly. Well, you would get much more information about that one particular individual. So if you would able, it would be able to have access to emails, to social, different types of data and accumulate that or add that to that particular individual, you'd have much more knowledge and probably tackle different problems when using unstructured data. But as I said, this is not an easy thing to do. And that's why it's so widely discussed within research and technologists. Is there anything else people are arguing over, like how to anonymize or new methods for it? There is a lot of, let's say, argumentation around the part of what's the difference between pseudonymization and anonymization. Let's say for you and me, anonymization is something we're comfortable with, we know a lot about. Actually, for lots of people, this is a complete new concept. This hasn't existed for very long. GDPR only came into effect in May 2018, which, let's say, was just around the corner. Uh, concepts such as anonymization and pseudonymization have not been discussed as much within companies beforehand. They were discussed, but not as deeply as we're discussing it now. So for most people, such concepts are completely new. My experience is, at least from customer discussions, is that we're also looking into, okay, uh, please define for me what is the difference between pseudonymization 
and anonymization. And the clear difference is that if you apply pseudonymization, you're really just taking, for example, my name, Kristen, and you put Mickey Mouse instead of Kristen. But all of the other identifiers, falsy identifiers, we call them, they remain the same. Whereas in anonymization, you're adding or you're generalizing, you're hiding the individuals in groups so that the person can no longer be identified. Whereas with pseudonymization, you have that possibility. You have that possibility to revert back and identify that one particular person. If you were giving advice to, say, a company that was going to work with another company, so some kind of a third-party interaction where some of the data sets were going to be shared, what would you recommend this company ask the other company, like to make sure that they were paying attention to this type of thing? I think it's always super important to get down to the use case, to really understand what is it the other person wants to get out of the data and then see if we have the right technology in place and the right people in place to actually do it, to actually put it to life. And then my final question here is just what other types of technology or concepts do you think, if people are trying to really understand data anonymization, if we had one of those whiteboard diagrams with data anonymization and we were going to say, and here's the other kinds of things that we should kind of look at. There is actually so much stuff to look at. I think this is so exciting and this is why my job excites me every day because first of all, you have the legal part, which is super interesting because we have so many countries that are just evolving laws with regards to data privacy and data regulation. So there's loads to learn on that side because if you work with different companies and different countries, well, you need to maybe get a better understanding of what is their current legislation and then see how you need to apply data anonymization, or maybe that country only asks for a type of data masking. I mean, you just have to understand, first of all, the legal regulation. Then I think we're getting more and more data and companies really have, let's say, a benefit with regards to other companies if they can use that data. And there's lots of lots of data that they're collecting that's personal. Big data is definitely a topic that you have to look into when you speak about data and anonymization. And then the last part is, okay, so you have that data and then what do you want to do with that data? Is it analytics? Is it machine learning? Is it artificial intelligence? I mean, if that data is no longer personal, what are the possibilities? Maybe there are possibilities that we're currently not even thinking about, but that are going to be, let's say, the standard in just about maybe two, three, four years time. Yeah, I think this is a super interesting field. And what's great is that it's currently evolving and evolving and evolving. There's more and more research done on this field. This is what keeps the topic so up to date and so interesting. What do you think is going to evolve out of it in two to three years? If you had to put your finger on something you think that most people aren't thinking about that you're like, ah, that's something I'm paying attention to. The most important, let's say, topic to solve is the unstructured data part, because then we would probably be able to think about use cases that are currently unthinkable. At least that's my current understanding and my current assumption. But maybe it's something completely different and something you and me, we're not even thinking about today. Very cool. Kristen, thank you. And I have to say, I know that German is your first language, but your English accent is phenomenal. And I'm wondering... It's like this combination between American and British. Can you tell us why? (laughs) Well, I used to live in Nebraska for some time and then moved over to the UK to Cambridge and Bristol. So it might be a trick of both. (laughs) It's, It's really cool. It's amazing how fluent you are too in a second language. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Again, I'll just say my guest was Kristen Jurich, who's Senior Solutions Specialist for HANA at SAP. Really good to have her on. Never miss an episode of What That Means with Camille by following us here on YouTube. You can also find episodes wherever you get your podcasts. The views and opinions expressed are those of the guests and author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Intel Corporation. Intel Corporation.